The 20th century saw mankind enter into a new scientific era. While many of the advancements in technology had profoundly positive effects, they also gave rise to new dangers. Among the greatest minds of the time was a scientist named Edward Teller. Perhaps more than any other, he is responsible for ushering in a new age of weapons with terrifying power. His name is still shrouded in controversy, and he is the topic of tonight's Real History. If you ask most Americans who's the most important nuclear physicist in the 20th century, I suppose most of them would probably say Albert Einstein, but they would be wrong. The most important nuclear scientist is Edward Teller, certainly for America and maybe for the history of the free world. Edward Teller was born in Hungary in 1908. He had an interest in science from a very early age, studied under one of the great eminent physicists in Europe, Werner Heisenberg. But then, in the 1930s, he grows the tide. ended up fleeing the Nazis when they seized power and wound up as a refugee in New York City, where he met with and worked with a team of other Hungarian refugees who were also physicists, including Leo Szilard. Szilard had typed up a letter that he was going to give to Albert Einstein, encouraging the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to begin research on using a nuclear chain reaction to create a bomb. Szilard was gonna take this letter to Albert Einstein at his summer home in Long Island. There was only one problem, and that was Zillard didn't drive. But he knew Teller did. So he asked him, he said, can you give me a lift out to Long Island? That led then to Edward Teller's involvement with that group of scientists who would become the core of what we know as the Manhattan Project, and eventually took him to Los Alamos, where he began work developing and assembling the atomic bomb Teller began to realize that the development of a bomb using nuclear reactions didn't have to stop at nuclear fission. The whole idea behind the atomic bomb was that you would set off a chain reaction that would break apart enriched uranium atoms. What Teller realized is that it was also possible to use that same chain reaction actually fusing lighter atoms, including hydrogen, into larger and larger compounds, releasing an energy very similar and exactly like the energy of the sun. And what you would end up with was a bomb that, whose destructive power would be measured not in thousands of tons of dynamite, but in millions of tons of what would come to be called the hydrogen bomb. So it wasn't until after the Manhattan Project was finished and the atomic bombs had been dropped on Hiroshima and in Nagasaki and the Second World War was over that Edward Teller was able to take up his ideas once again. And so Teller took himself to the Atomic Energy Commission and urged its head to begin work now on the development of the hydrogen bomb. The Atomic Energy Commission was not very happy about this kind of idea. Remember, this is shortly after World War II. Most people at the time were interested in ending wars, not in building up new arsenals for future wars. Through sheer persistence, Teller finally got the Atomic Energy Commission and President Harry Truman to sign on. And in January of 1950, Truman announced the United States would now develop a thermonuclear weapon, the hydrogen bomb. Teller had to create his own nuclear lab which became the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California. And it's there that Teller and his team were able to construct a workable thermonuclear device, which was tested in 1952, codenamed Mike. It measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. The fireball alone would engulf one quarter of Manhattan. The test astonished the world. And many at the time feared that the Cold War arms race had taken a new and dangerous turn. The test had come just in time, because only seven months later, the Soviets tested their own thermonuclear device. For Teller, the key issue all through the Cold War years was how does the United States not just maintain a balance of nuclear weapons, but how it remains ahead of the arms race. Teller's forthright anti-Soviet stance strong belief that America really was morally superior 
power in the Cold War struggle often got him bad press in the media as well. By the time of the Vietnam War, the criticism of Teller began to accelerate. He was even being branded as a war criminal. Teller used to say, if you fight for a desperate cause and you have good reason to fight, you usually win. And so he fought. He fought against the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. He fought against Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties and against the Anti-Missile Treaty in 1972. Nothing, he believed, that could be put down on paper would ever restrain the Soviets from pursuing their own dream of world domination. It was with a sense of immense relief that Teller got the news in November of 1980 that Ronald Reagan was going to be the new president of the United States. So in September of 1982, Edward Teller came to the White House for a meeting with Reagan and laid out to him some of the research that his colleagues at Livermore and elsewhere were doing on the use of precision guided using GPS systems, missiles, as a way to shoot down incoming ballistic missiles before they entered the atmosphere. And so in 1983, Reagan laid out his idea based on Teller's research, which he called Strategic Defense Initiative. The response from the media and from politicians was immediate ridicule and derision. Senator Edward Kennedy coined a phrase, Star Wars. How would this ever be possible? The idea of shooting down missiles before they even reach their targets. Then, in 2003, the United States Missile Defense Agency was able to test its first anti-missile shootdown. Teller would not live to see the ultimate successful test of an anti-missile in 2005, nor would he see the final shootdown of a satellite in space by an American guided missile in 2008, the one which has now made Star Wars far from being a term of derision, now into a reality in our lives and in a defense of America. As he said towards the end of his life, if I contributed just 1% to the fall of the Soviet Union and communism, that's still a very powerful contribution. <laughs>